Today, July 1st, 2013, I stand here not in an early celebration, but in memorial. I am standing on the grounds that perhaps serve as the final resting place for a countless number of lost souls. Souls that gave everything they had for what they believed in. They fought a fight not against others, but against former citizens of the same nation. All in a fight over one issue. One issue that shaped the entire country. That issue was slavery. Something so simple and traditional at the time caused such a massive conflict. A day of conflict that killed so many Americans. Today marks the 150th anniversary of the first day of perhaps the bloodiest battle in American history. So today, let us all remember what occurred here almost 150 years ago at the Battle of Gettysburg. Tonight, men, tonight we enjoy ourselves, for tomorrow we face a great fight. A fight that shall be remembered by our children's children. A fight that we will win. A fight to retain the Union. So men, tonight you will enjoy yourselves. Enjoy yourselves as if tonight is your last night, as it very well could be. Feast like you have never feasted before. Dine as if tonight is your last supper. Drink as if you will never see water again, for tomorrow we will succeed, and the Confederates shall retreat. No man shall ever attempt to take our land again after tomorrow. This is our war. We must fight for what is right and defeat what is wrong. So tonight, I propose a toast. A toast to the best men in the world. A toast to you fellows. Huzzah! Well, here's to you, man. And to who we left behind. I wish Don would never come. As do I, Ambrose. I am truly regretting leaving my family to, family to come here. It seemed like the right thing to do at the time, but now I fear my sons won't be able to support the elders when I die. I fear I left them too young. I had a nice position at the mines that opened up a couple of years back. I do not know what the boys will do when I die. A breaker boy job isn't enough to feed three mouths. At least you two men were able to make families for yourselves. I left the family farm a year after I, left, after I turned 18. I had two dreams as I grew up. One was to do good somehow, somewhere. The other was to start a family and pass down to the farm, as my father was about to do for me. I guess I wish I could have met someone to start a family with, just to give myself a little hope, just to know that there was some chance. I just wanted to be able to say goodbye to the missus before I had left. I had told her that I was just going to the neighboring town to see about buying more land. I told her I should be gone no more than a week. But when I got down to the town, there was a man. He was going around asking if people were willing to join the army. So I questioned him, what's in it for me? He told me I'd get a rifle from the local shop, a knife, and $15 up front. At the time, the deal seemed incredible, so I took him up on the offer. Sadly, this was all about a year ago. Only an additional 51 more weeks and I had told the missus. She probably thinks I'm dead now. I just wish she would know. There's just so more I wish I could have experienced before I asked tomorrow. Calvin, my dear friend, I think that holds true for nearly everyone in this world. There are plenty of things I still regret not doing before I decided to give my services to my country. But George, you've asked your ten years on me. You've had time to do much more than I've even imagined. See, Calvin, ten years did not add extra pleasure to my life. Indeed, it has brought me wisdom, financial stability, and my family, but besides that, it hasn't brought me anything else but age. Yes, but did you bring you one thing that I lack, and that still is a family. I haven't had an extended conversation with another woman, let alone even thought of starting an actual marriage. It will probably be a dream that I carry with me to my deathbed. Calvin, you can't be that upset over the matter. 
Yes, perhaps you still lack a spouse, but we're still alive and we could very well be tomorrow. There's nothing stopping you from finishing out some more time here, then heading back to your hometown to find that one someone. Yes, but I don't think a single one of us three will see the daylight of the day following tomorrow. Tonight is our last meal we share together, so why bother thinking about the future when there's not even days worth of sun left? And that's an attitude like that that gets men killed. You're determined to die angry man, aren't you, Calvin? You wish you can go out hating what you did, don't you, son? No, that's not it. I just don't like to prolong the inevitable. Well, man, we have a long day ahead of us tomorrow. I'm going to go find a place to rest for a little bit, reserve a little strength. All right, Ambrose. Good night, Fred. Good night, Ambrose. As I was saying, Calvin, what you're doing is what most weak and scared men do. They fear the future. They fear what's going to happen so they don't want it to even occur at all. You want to die as a way to avoid failure and reject rejection. You would rather not even attempt something and risk the failure involved in the task. It's the strategy of a coward. Well, you can think what you wish, but I'm going to get a little bit more food. Good night, George. Good night, Calvin. Mom, is that your bag there? Um, Jelly, sorry, sir. That's my bag out there. I was getting prepared for tomorrow. What do you mean getting prepared for tomorrow? You're a woman. You don't belong on the battlefield. Oh, dear sir, you weren't assuming that I was going out in the battle now, were you? Myself and a couple other townswomen had come to volunteer our time to help the wounded. I felt it was the least we could do to aid the war. So you're telling me three women have decided to come to our camp and help those who are hurt in the battle tomorrow? That's the most selfish, selfless things you could do for a soldier. Thank you. May I ask your name, sir? Calvin. Calvin Adams. Calvin, may I ask, did you happen to grow up in a little farm area around 10 miles west of York? Well, yes. Yes, I did. Why do you ask? The porters from a few farms over. Do you remember them? Yes. Why? Yes. Why? I'm Carl Porter's daughter. Carl! Carl Porter! The farm four houses down. You're his daughter? How do you ever end up living down here? Well, when I got married, my husband wanted to move here to this little town, so we picked up and came down here. Is your husband fine with us tomorrow? Well, I wish he was. I lost him four months ago in a small battle. Now that's why I decided to come down here and stay the week to help out the injured soldiers, just in hope to save a few. A few whose families were still wishing for their relatives out there to come home. I don't want anyone else to have to experience what I did. Oh, Miss Porter, I'm so sorry. I didn't know. No, please don't apologize. You're unaware. I should have been clear when I brought him up. Yes. Well, enough about me. Tell me about your family. My family. My family's no different than when I was on the farm. Father still tended to the cattle. While my mother still has her hands full of the four younger ones. Not that family. Your other family. Your wife, maybe children. Oh, that family. No, I don't have a family of my own yet. Last year, about two weeks after my 18th birthday, I joined here. I've been here ever since. It's the first time I've done anything else besides work on the farm. I haven't had time to even think about beginning a family. What a shame. My husband came here to me about three years ago. Everything seemed promising. He had the family trade in line, all for when his father died, the business would be his. Then he decided that he wanted to assist the country just mere days after Lincoln had called for volunteers after the blemo at Fort Sumner. From there, everything just went downhill. After the last day, he walked out the door. I never saw him again. I heard from him through letters, but it just wasn't the same. Well, I suppose it's a good thing. I was about starting a family then, isn't it? Well, if you consider living out your final days of your life alone, then no. But for what could have been your family's sake, I suppose so. So, what you're saying is I sacrificed my life for the sake of someone else's enjoyment? Well, that's not completely true. Please elaborate. If you were to have a wife right now, she wouldn't spend her time at home weeping over you. She'd be out in the factories working just as you would have if you moved to a city. The community needs people to produce materials to help fund this war. Guns, blankets, and ammo. They don't make themselves, you know. Perhaps you could have helped as a nurse here in the field. That's a job I have now. It's not typically for her woman. It isn't a job that anyone can get just easily. There's only a small number that I'm aware of. However, maybe another cancer could be more. If you could estimate a number, how many women would you say have a job as a camp nurse? I'm not quite sure. If I'd have to give a number for the whole union, I'd say about 4,000. Oh, all right. Do you enjoy working as a nurse? No, not at all. It's a horrific job by far. It makes me feel so upset that nothing else can be done to help some of these men. We've had men come in with nails lodged in their hands, num multiple gunshot wounds, and have severed limbs all while still fully conscious and still in pain. The hardest part of the job is walking by those that nothing else can be done and immediately listening to them sincerely beg for any help you can give them. These are men who they've given three years to their country, only to be left in a corner of a camp and die a horrible and painful death. Helping the men at these times just isn't much of a nightmare. I got recruited in one battle to help the amputations. That was one of the most gruesome experiences I've ever endured. My job was to stand there as soldier flailed, fought, and screamed, and hold them down as the doctor sawed off whatever limb was injured. The screams still haunt my dreams. I can't even begin to imagine having cold, hard, serrated steel forcefully sawed through my leg, all while having no choice but to sit there and watch it happen with no way out. 
My other option would be to die a week later from infection setting in. It's just beyond my comprehension, even though I've partaken in many amputations. I just can't imagine going anywhere or doing anything without a leg or arm. I have an enormous deal of respect for each and every man stepping foot on the battlefield tomorrow because they are truly sacrificing both limb and life for our country. Granted, tomorrow is not my first battle. It is the biggest battle I'm going to fight in. There are more than 20 times any amount of men I've ever seen gather for one single fight. The only time I've ever come in contact with a Confederate soldier was once. It had to be when we were guarding a weapons cache. A soldier strayed from his group before he could say a word. All four of us shot him right through the chest. That was my only encounter I ever had with an enemy soldier. I had done whatever jobs I could have to stay out of battles. Now today's battle was a battle I just couldn't avoid. It was actually a large scale battle I had been recruited for. I was devastated. I would heard the horror stories of large battles, the shellings, the canisters, amputations, you name it. I was scared out of my mind. When I left the farm, I thought I actually wouldn't be fighting in a war. I thought it would be as simple as army war marches into Richmond, we take over, we're done, we're heroes. Sadly, that wasn't the case. Farm is the one thing I wish I could have stayed on. I really wish I could have just stayed home. I don't want to die tomorrow. I guess while I go home. Well, Calvin, it's getting awfully late and tomorrow's a big day. I'm heading off to catch a little sleep. Good night, Calvin. It was a pleasure to see you again, Elizabeth. Good night. Man, from the looks of it, Hill is bringing his men in from the Northwest. I want us to hold our soil no matter what happens today. We shall not allow this little town to our southeast be leveled by the weasels that are trying to invade our land. They left us. They hung us out to dry. Why should we let them back into the Union of America? They are not American. They deserve to be snuffed in their effort today. They are not men of honor. They are men of greed, men of selfishness. These are men who cannot even do their own work. They want us to keep other people to do their work for them. They don't even so much as help these people. What makes you think these people are capable of fighting for themselves? They left their slaves at home. They can't pick corn without the help of a slave. They can't feed cattle without the help of a slave. They can't maintain their farm without a slave. What makes you think that they are able to fight without their slaves? So men, gather your arms, gather your spirits, gather your courage, gather your strength, gather your energy, but most importantly, gather your brothers. Join together, unite as one. For today, we don't fight as individuals. We don't fight as troops. We don't fight as soldiers. We don't fight as infantry. But today, we fight as one. We fight as the United States of America. We fight for the United States of America. And most importantly, we are the United States of America. So men, raise your arms with me. We are one. We are one. We are one. We are one. We are united. We are united. We are strong. We are strong. But most of all, we are the United States of America. Huzzah! Huzzah! I'm extremely nervous. Don't be, Calvin. A battle isn't all that the men claim it to be. What about all the shells and canisters? Do you hear that they're designed to explode in midair? They'll rain down all this shrapnel on us, and we won't stand a chance. And some of them. Some of them, they even fill with bullets or rocks or nails or anything, because that'll cause damage when it hits you. Doesn't that scare you? Calvin, be quiet. They can't put nails into a shell. It would be a waste and it wouldn't work. Besides, that not, that's not nearly lethal enough to kill anyone. That'll leave a couple of cuts. You can just wrap some cloth around it and you're good to go. Wouldn't even harm a fly. You can't be too sure of that, George. Look at these new guns Winchester is coming out with. They have a musket that you don't have to reload any, every time you shoot, and it's much more accurate. They call them rifles. They can be shot as fast as you pull the trigger. They've got some pretty dangerous stuff out there. I wouldn't underestimate what they're firing at you. At least I'm not the only one who's worried around here. Well, Calvin, I wouldn't say that I'm worried. I'd just say I'm cautious. There's nothing to worry about. Just as long as you are careful, you will be fine out there. Trust me, this isn't my first time fighting in a battle, and it surely will not be my last. How can you be sure? that you'll come out of this battle alive and well. Confidence is the best trait to have when going into a fight, and fear is the worst. You need to be sure of yourself if you are ever going to attempt anything. Fear leaves you in a panicked, unaware state that you're not fully aware of your surroundings, which compromises your safety. Yes, I see what you're saying. I just really hope that I can clear my mind before anything else drastic happens to me.
Don't we all, Calvin? Don't we all? The battle of the first day had begun in the early morning hours, as the Confederates marched in from the northwest. They eventually collided with the Union as they began to fight. It was a long day for those fighting. Those who had fallen were replaced throughout the day as reinforcements arrived for both the North and the South armies. The day of battle was long and strenuous on both, but the North had been first to retreat by around 4 o'clock in the afternoon. They made a south-southeast retreat toward and through the area known as Gettysburg. Ambrose! 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 George, trace it. Ambrose is dead. You saw it for yourself. He can't be dead. Well, he is. That's all because he was way too overly confident when he went to battle, he was careless in his actions, and his carelessness cost him the ultimate price. How much longer do you think we have to wait? Another soldier told me that the medics has about an hour and a half. What do you mean, the medics? Are you hurt, Calvin? No, George, I'm not injured. Then why are you heading to the medic? What do you mean, why am I heading for the medics? You have a nail lodged halfway in your forearm, George. And it doesn't look good at all. Oh, Calvin, don't be worried. It's just a flesh wound, and it's not a big deal at all. Don't worry about it. George, it's not a wound I'm worried about. It's the infection. We have to get it fixed immediately. Calvin, I insist it's no big deal. The wound will heal up on its own. And besides, there's plenty of other soldiers who need the medic much more than I do. It'll heal itself up, only if you end up like Ambrose out there. Would you want that, George? It's not that bad, Calvin. I insist it's just a flesh wound. Well, I don't care what you think, George. It's an old rusty nail that's halfway locked in your forearm. It's a matter of time before the infection kicks in. We're going to the medic, whether you like it or not, and that's final. Fine, Calvin. If you insist so bad, then I'll do it to please you. Elizabeth! Yes, Calvin? Thank God I found you. I have a buddy who needs some help. He's got a nail halfway locked in his forearm. Can you do anything? Well, the most you could do would be amputating it right above the elbow. Will that prevent the infection? Well, it's the protect best protection we have, so just bring him over here to this table, and I'll get the doctor. Alright, thank you. Alright, George, they'll be able to save you from the infection. Come on, let's go get started. Sounds great. Which arm seems to be the problem? My left one. I think we'll have to amputate it. Follow me. Okay. This one simple battle has taken a terrible turn for the worst for us, Calvin. Indeed it has, George. Not if you lost your left arm, but we lost Andrew's arm. Yes, sadly so. He went out honorably. He went out with his country first and himself second. I have high respects for him. I... Uh, I just don't know what to make of all this. There sadly is not a lot to say about today. I just really wish we didn't lose Ambrose. I would have given my other arm for him. I just hope today that people like Ambrose are never forgotten in the many years to come. People like Ambrose deserve the utmost respect. Many lay dead here on these same grounds 150 years ago today. All of these men were committed men of both sides. These men are who we honor today. These men gave both life and limb for the being of our country. The very least we could do for these men is give our respects for them as we remember a time of sorrow, hate, pain, grief, and despair. Now, I would like to close today's tribute in the same way which the first tribute was given back in November of 1863. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war testing whether that nation, or any nation so conceived and so dedicated, can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hollow this cramp. Brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, have consecrated it, far above our poor power to add or, or detract. The world will little note, nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here, have dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored.
He hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. I have seen him in the watchfire of a hundred circling camps. They have builded him an altar in the evening dews and damp. I can read his righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamp. His day Oh. 